In our previous chapter, I showed you how that the birth and death of our Lord Jesus Christ were marked by cosmic events in the heavens. But did you also know that both his death and resurrection were also marked by subsequent earthquakes? In Matthew 27, 50-51, the scripture record the following. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in train from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, we also find that the scripture highlighted the earthquake tremor that preceded Jesus' resurrection. It states, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from the sky and came and rolled away the stone from the door and sat on it. So before Mary arrived at the tomb of Jesus and saw the pair of angels and the resurrected Lord, there was an earthquake. And these earthquakes at Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection occurred within a three days period. A study of the Earth's interior and seismic activity by seismologists who specialize in the study of earthquakes and provided scientific data that correspond with the discovery of sedimentary disturbances in the region of the Dead Sea, 13 miles from Jerusalem, when combined and examined along with the biblical astronomical information of a solar eclipse occurrence at the time of Jesus' crucifixion as revealed to us in the scriptures, they cited Friday, April 3rd, 33 CE as the best match for the date of Jesus' crucifixion. Again, Friday, April 3rd, 33 CE. For those who still have a problem believing in the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, sleep on that a little. You may have a change of mind when you wake up or a nightmare while you're sleeping. So why is this all necessary, you may ask me. They are necessary because supernatural claims necessitate supernatural evidences. It's the way of divine truth to leave compelling evidences, infallible proofs, and eyewitnesses in his path. We live in a generation that believes in a lie quicker than they believe in the truth because they don't look at the past. A Russian proverb tells us that with lies you may go ahead in the world, but you can never go back. This is because a truth can be traced to a past, but a lie cannot. The solar eclipse and earthquakes are necessary inscriptions and historical footings for God's handwriting and footprints in the sky and sands of time to corroborate the undeniable and incontestable revelation of the universal truth about Jesus' death and resurrection. So if at all you happen not to have read the Bible or believe in the central claim of Christianity about Jesus' death and resurrection for all mankind, you will have no excuse when you stand before His Majesty on the Day of Judgment. But for those of us who already believe, this is a further encouragement to our faith in Christ and to what we already know to be true in our personal experiences about the timeless witness of Jesus Christ in life and death. We may have heard the ethnocentric gospel of the God of Israel and the King of the Jews who was crucified in the land of Israel but have we heard the geocentric gospel of the Lord of the earth and the cosmocentric gospel of the Lord of the heavens, of which I am appointed and commissioned by the benevolent grace of the triune Godhead as a custodian and steward to bring to us on this day? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20, the scripture tells us, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So have we heard the geocentric gospel of the kingdom of God from the loins of the earth, and can we hear the cosmocentric gospel of the kingdom of heaven? This is the gospel of the kingdom and the witness of the Spirit of God to all nations and people under heaven. It is fascinating and sad to see how oblivious and ignorant men could be at the scene of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. With a solar eclipse of about, about three hours climaxed with an earthquake that was tiny enough to shake the crucifixion grounds, but kind enough not to harm anyone many were still unable to perceive the voice of nature's cry and its appeal to their physical and human senses. It is no marvel, Jesus told the Father on the cross, to forgive them because they were so mentally ignorant and blind that they could not read the signs except the centurion soldier and those who stood with him. Matthew 27, 54 narrates, 
Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. In addition to the geological witness of Jesus' death, the book of Matthew 27, 53-54, I lie to us one of the reasons for the second earthquake, which occurred before its resurrection from the dead. Let's take a look at this passage of scripture, which states, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. In other words, Jesus the saint and our saint after his resurrection caused a tremor so violent in the mantle and core of the earth that awakened the bodies of past saints. Men like Father Abraham and King David appeared to several inhabitants of Jerusalem and witnessed to them in order to make a first fruit testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a Messiah they have all waited on who has now risen from the dead and had freed them from the temporal prison of death to be witnesses of his resurrection power. The prayers of the rich man in Hades, when he saw the poor Lazarus he used to know, standing next to Father Abraham in another plane of existence beside Hades, who prayerfully said to Father Abraham to please send someone from the underworld to witness to his brothers and relatives on earth about the nature of reality in Hades. After death, were finally answered, yet many would not believe. Now, this is a profound revelation that many in the church have failed to understand. God permits and can permit saints of old who have long gone to visit others for the witness of Jesus Christ and because of his resurrection and ascension powers. In Matthew 22 verse 32, the, the scripture said, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. We those who are carnally minded cannot comprehend. In Romans 14 verse 9, after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the scriptures record that Jesus is both the Lord of the dead and the living because Christ has both died and risen. And when he returns again, many more saints, whether alive or dead, will be freed from the prison of mortality and raised from the dead to be permanently invincible and immortal like he is. You see, it is possible that when you read the book of Isaiah, for Isaiah himself to walk into your study to explain his writings to you, and it is possible for Ezekiel and Jeremiah to help to elucidate your mind and strengthen your resolve when you're facing a similar challenge as they have. The scriptures are not dead writings of old saints. They are living witnesses of the resurrection power of Jesus and spiritual maps and portals to locations and realms of illumination. If you believe in the resurrection and ascension of Christ, then you are seated with him in heavenly places. I have met Elijah. Elisha and John the Baptist, while in prayer and meditating on the scriptures, I've encountered ancient men that I never even knew of, like Apostle Joseph Ibabalola, because of the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I give God all the praise and honor for these encounters. They are certain cosmolog cosmological and geological events that point to the return of the Lord, and they are orders that are caused by human activities yet still most are caused by nature's deteriorating adversities. And lastly, some are caused by the presence and influence of evil entities in the earth. As the title of this message entails, I would like to highlight to you the signs in the earth that point to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ in recent times, which began this year in the month of February. On the 6th of February, 2023, as reported to the world through several media outlets, a cataclysmic earthquake struck southern and central Turkey with a devastating ripple effect in northern and western Syria, and there was a widespread damage with tens of thousands of fatalities. It was a very heartbreaking and heart-wrenching sight to see, and the toll of the wounded lives and the devastating losses that were claimed by this earthquake was colossal in proportion. Turkey and Syria are still recovering and rebuilding from this disaster, but Turkey has been warned again by seismologists of another anticipated earthquake they forecast will happen in the near future in Istanbul, which they are now preparing for. And as earthquake engineers will often express, earthquakes do not kill people. Buildings kill people. While I understand their logic, I do not necessarily agree with their sentiment, but they are right 
in that if the structural integrity of a building is not firmly established, it can compromise the strength of a building if the building is struck with a turbulent tremor of an earthquake or a quiver by another element of nature. In places where the foundation of a building are firmly rooted, an earthquake of an astronomical size would cause minimal damage, if any. But in places where the foundation of a building are loosely rooted, even a small earthquake can claim many lives and cause many losses. This brief introspection reminds me of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, when he said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The message to take from this scripture is that the Lord Jesus is our firm foundation. Even in the most difficult times, whether physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, you can trust Him and His words. There's a saying that the bird that sits on a tree is never afraid of the branch breaking, because our trust is not in the branch, but in our wings. This is why it is wise to build our trust in the one who is eternal, because everything visible and material, however secure the same, are temporal, and it can certainly fail and disappoint us. But even in death, Jesus was physically and materially victorious. Who would have thought that a Titanic ship could sink in the ocean, and an ark of gopher wood by Noah could survive a global flood? When God breathes on something or someone, it is different. Now, why is the earthquake in Turkey one of the geological signs of the Lord's return? There have been deadlier earthquakes in the past that claimed more lives and caused greater damages. There was even a recent earthquake in Morocco that was severely turbulent and hazardous. But it's not the earthquake alone that we should look at. It's the location where it transpired and its context that makes the relevant to biblical prophecy. So why Turkey? Before I delve any further, there's a scripture I would like us to peruse in our contemplation of the Lord's return. Matthew 24, 37, 38 state, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the hack. Evidently, from these verses of scriptures, the Lord provides us with one of the signs of His coming by comparing it to the days of Noah. Now please understand that the days of Noah do not only point to the return of the Lord Jesus, but it is also characterized by a variety of several sociological and geological features in society. Some of these may include human attempts to alter the genetic identity and structure, also known as sex change, transhumanism or bioengineering, which is similar to the genetic modification of humans who lived in the days of Noah and hybridized their genealogy with fallen angelic beings through sexual intercourse. The days of Noah were also characterized with other sexual perversions, moral decadence, a mental health global crisis, particularly in the imaginations of the people, as revealed to us by God himself in Genesis chapter 6 verse 7. Alien invasions by the fallen ones, many weddings, flooding, heavy rainfalls and the appearance of the rainbow, which has gathered more publicity than usual by the LGBTQ community activities banners in several parades and protesting. I have learned from personal experience that even when unintended, the evil that men do to harm those who are good and to corrupt the things that are sacred can assist with God's bidding. Proverbs 20 verse 24 state, Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his ways? Yet all this list of activities are the sociological factors. There's another factor that has evaded the prophetic forum and the public eye. And it is the answer to my previous question, why Turkey? In 2004, a media team led by Andrew Yuen and Man Fei and Pastor Boaz Kwong announced their discovery of Noah's hack on Mount Ararat in Turkey. But they were met with skepticism. 
from some geologists and historians as to be expected. They reported that they had found a large wooden structure at an elevation of 4,200 meters during their fourth trip to the mountain. After similar sightings by another exploring team between 2007, 2008, 2009, and again in 2010, a team of evangelical Christian explorers claimed they have found the remains of Noah's Ark beneath the snow and volcanic debris on Turkey's Mount Ararat. Genesis chapter 8 verse 4 states, And the hack rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. We all know planes travel by air and ships by the sea, but God provided an irrefutable evidence for the global flood in the days of Noah when he placed Noah's hack on a 4,200 feet mountain peak as his final resting place. Genesis chapter 7 verse 20 tells us that the waters of the flood rose and covered the mountain tops to a depth of 15 cubits. A 15 cubit height is approximately 7,000 meters tall. You would have to be a titanic fool to find Noah's hack on a 4,200 meters mountain top and disbelieve the story of Noah and a global flood. Subsequently, many Christians evidently believe the mountainous peaks and regions of Ararat in Turkey was the final resting place of Noah's Ark. Just as the Bible stated and described that the Ark that Noah built protected Noah and his family and the pairs of various animal species on earth during a global flood that wiped out most of humanity. The team of explorers from the Noah's Ark Ministries in 2010 further expressed that the radiocarbon dated wood taken from the discovery site of Mount Ararat shows that the purported Ark is approximately 4,800 years old, which coincides roughly with the time of Noah's flood as implied by the Bible. The story of the flood of Noah is recorded and reiterated in various forms and in dozens of ancient cultures depicting massive floods. Yet several geologists and historians find the story of Noah irreconcilable with the artistic worldview and the understanding of the world. Ironically, a vast distance across the globe between Turkey and California in the United States of America provided yet another corroborating evidence to substantiate the story of Noah, the oldest living tree on our planet, known as Methuselah in the National Forest White Mountains in California, UCA, is reported to be 4,855 years old. And remember what I told you before, that a piece of wood from the purported hack of Noah discovered in Turkey had been subjected to carbon dating by the team of explorers in 2010 and was estimated to be approximately 4,800 years old. Evidently, both dates coincide and complement each other, as the oldest living tree or thing that's been confirmed in our planet is also pointing to the hack of Noah in Turkey as a universal and parallel truth. Finally, as recent as April 2021, a team of archaeologists using an advanced 3D scans of the area in eastern Turkey, believed to be the location of Mount Ararat, confirmed it to be true to be the true location of Noah's Ark. Researcher Andrew Jones and lead scientist Dr. Fethi Ahmed Yuxel of the Department of Geophysical Engineering, Applied Geophysics Department of Instable University, told the British media that the 3D scans of the area discovered a formation of the exact length of the hack, detailed in the Bible, as being around 300 cubits in biblical terms. Quoting the words of the researcher Andrew Jones, he said, such parallel line and right angles below the surface is something you would not expect to see in a natural geological formation. But these results are what you would expect to see if this is a man-made boat matching the biblical requirements of Noah's hack. So as previously highlighted to us from the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, the ark of Noah in Turkey is our first geological evidence for the return of the Lord. Though mountains are geological features of our planet, the discovery and confirmation of Noah's hack on the mountains of Ararat is a geological factor for the return of the Lord. So Noah's hack on Mount Ararat is both a geological fe feature and factor for the return of the Lord. Secondly, the earthquake in Turkey in the month of February this year is another geological factor. Certainly, there are earthquakes in other countries and locations that are correlated to the return of the Lord Jesus. But Turkey's earthquake is prophetically poignant and significant. Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 7 that one of the frequent geological hazards that will precede his return are earthquakes in various places. So sadly, there's a spiritual reason for earthquakes, besides the scientific explanations that seismologists provide for them. 
which I will share with you before or by the end of our discourse in this segment. Contrary to many religious thinking, God is not directly responsible for many earthquakes on our planet, even the ones that point to the return of the Lord Jesus. It's not a spiritual reason for this that I will share with us in a few moments. Though several preachers are quick to attribute a natural disaster as an act of punishment from God, but if this was the case, why have many faithful Christians been victims of natural disasters? It is more complicated than we often assume, but I'll come to this in a little while. There are plagues that are human caused and plagues that are nature caused and there are plagues with supernatural origins, whether from evil or good. Like I showed you at the beginning, the earthquake that occurred at the time of Jesus' death and resurrection did not take any lives, though this would have been well deserved for the religious mob who conspired together with the people to crucify him. It would have been well deserved and justifiable for God to do so at the crucifixion of his son, yet God did not take any lives by either earthquakes or it would have been recorded in the historical archives of the crucifixion story. Now another brief correlation between the ark on Mount Ararat and the earthquake in Turkey is this. Mountains are often created by earthquakes. Science tells us that the earth is made of three layers. The top layer is known as the crust, and beneath the crust is the mantle, and beneath the mantle is the core of the earth. While the crust and surface of the earth is a thin hard skin, the mantle of the earth is a thick semi-solid layer, and it is divided into an upper and lower mantle. The upper mantle and crust together makes up the lithosphere of the earth, and the base of the lithosphere of the earth are made of seven large tectonic plates in different sizes and shapes, and there are other smaller tectonic plates as well that were previously fitted together with the seven large tectonic plates like a jigsaw puzzle. The seven large tectonic plates are the base of the seven continents of the earth, and together with other smaller fragments of tectonic plates that have now drifted, drifted apart, had previously formed one supercontinent of the earth. In Isaiah 42 verse 5, the scripture states, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives bread to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. So therefore, the underlying theme of expansion in the atmosphere of the cosmic heavens is also mirrored in the lithosphere of the earth. As the heavens expand, the earth is also expanding, but more particularly is the tectonic plate that lies beneath the earth's crust and surface that is drifting apart in expansion. Beneath the earth's surface, there is an intense heat and pressure that is conducted by circular motion of convection current, which is responsible for the division and drifting apart of the previously one supercontinent in the seven different continents, which they represent Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, and Antarctica. And there are of course other smaller islands and miscellaneous terrains that are scattered across the planet. If we examine the margin of the size of some of the tectonic plates like the African tectonic plate and the South America tectonic plate, we can see they used to be joined together and have drifted apart from each other. This continental drift fueled by the moving plates on our ocean and lands are what is responsible for earthquakes and the formation of mountains, hills, volcanoes, and several other geological features on our planet. When two smaller tectonic plates break apart from each other, the molten magma liquid heat within the mantle of the earth may seep to the crust and surface of the earth to form a volcano. And if two tectonic plates crash into each other, depending on the way they collide, two tectonic plate crashes into each other can erect a protruding mountain formation from the earth's surface to the sky. I understand this might be a boring deviation for some of us from our previous discourse, but this is the scientific explanation for the natural causes of earthquakes. I have to include this perspective so we can have a more integrated understanding of our subject matter. Now returning to where we left off before this scientific interlude. We can now understand why I said the hack of Noah on Turkey's mountain, Ararat, and a recent earthquake in Turkey have similar origins because mountains are sometimes formed when earthquakes occur. It is believed that Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world today, and other surrounding mountains in this region were formed by earthquakes. But there is still another puzzle that enthralled me 
as the law revealed the geological factors for its return. I had included the discovery of Noah's hack on Mount Ararat in Turkey. If the hack of Noah had been located in Turkey, and the lost return would be as the days of Noah, as the scriptures reveal, certainly the story of Noah can be expected to be reenacted in similar ways in modern times. But if so, where is the geological evidence for the habitation of the fallen angels that invaded the antiquated civilizations of Noah? Now this brings us to the third geological factor for the return of the Lord. Because we cannot speak about Noah and not reference the fallen angels who invaded the world of men in his days, of whom Lucifer, also now known as Satan, is the chief among the fallen angels. There is a prophetic thread and history between the days and act of Noah and the rise of the fallen ones. What the fallen ones tried to accomplish in previous times is similar to what they wish to accomplish again. Already we can see their influence in society, where several men and women and boys and girls are opting for a gender reassignment surgery to alter their sex from birth, and some have expressed their need to identify themselves as a non-binary gender, as non-humans and even animals with a plural pronoun. This makes it easier for the fallen angels to hide among humans and to cleverly cohabitate with humans covertly. The LGBTQ and non-binary gender movement is much more than the eye reveals. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 12 to 13, the scriptures reveal the following. And to the angel of the church in Pegamos, write, This thing said he which hath the sharp sword with two hedges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou oughtest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. This is an intriguing verse of scripture. Allegedly, Satan, who is the chief prince of the fallen angels, has a throne and residence on planet Earth in the region of Pegamos. But the question we might ask is this, where is Pegamos? Pegamos was an ancient Greek city, located on the north edge of the Caicos Plain and has been occupied by various nationalities, including Romans and Arabs in times past, but it is today occupied by the city of Pegama in Turkey. Pegamos in Greece also means height or elevation. Isaiah 14, 14 tells us that the promising of Lucifer was his prideful ambition to ascend into an elevated height that was exclusive to God, but in the course of his prideful ambition, God cast him down to the underworld. So it appears that three geological factors for the return of the Lord is situated in modern-day Turkey. One, the recent earthquake in the month of February and another anticipated earthquake in Istanbul, Turkey. Two, Noah's hack discovered on Mount Ararat. And three, the biblical location for the habitation of Satan's throne and his fallen angels. As far as the east is from the west, Noah's Hak is situated in the eastern Turk and region of Turkey, and the city of Begama is situated in Turkey's western region. Turkey may not be known as a Christian nation or celebrated as such, but it is a pivotal ground for end time prophecies. And it is a unique and special location with a geopolitical and cultural significance for the world over. The scriptures tell us that before the Lord returns, the Antichrist, who is an impersonate of the Lord Jesus, will emerge, and his empowerment to rule will be bestowed on him by Satan, whose dwelling place is in the Eurasia tectonic region of Turkey. So Turkey plays a key part in helping us to diagnose the prophetic calendar of the end times. Now, I don't believe the Antichrist currently resides in Turkey, but there's a correlation between the near future Turkey and the enthronement of the Antichrist. Revelation 13 verse 2 revealed that one of the things the beast was given beside his power and authority by the dragon was his seat. There is not a lot I can say on camera, but if you're really listening, you will understand and pray for the people of Turkey. We must pray for the spiritual climate of Turkey, that the gospel of Jesus Christ will penetrate the minds and hearts of its inhabitants and people. There is more that I cannot say on camera, but those who pray will understand the significance of praying for Turkey and helping the Christians on ground. There's also a fourth and fifth geological factor for the return of the Lord in recent times, which I will discuss with you in the next segment. But I remembered making a promise to explain the spiritual reasons why earthquakes sometimes occur to signify the return of the Lord. 
The book of Luke chapter 19 verse 37 to 40 elucidates this reason to us. Let us see what it says. Now as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God, rejoicing with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said, If I tell you, if these were silent, the stones will cry out. As shown to us in this passage of scripture, the disciples of Jesus were exuberantly expressive in honoring, praising, and talking about Jesus in the public space. But as they did this, a religious mob threatened to silence them and even asked Jesus to tell the disciples to keep quiet. But Jesus answered the mob saying that the repercussion of his followers' censorship and silence would be that the stones and rocks will cry out. Now, don't forget that Jesus gave this admonition to the Pharisees as he approached the foot of the Mount of Olives. Because I will revisit this shortly to verify the illumination I'm providing for your edification on the spiritual grounds and reasons for certain earthquakes. What the Lord was simply saying here is do not persecute his followers or try to silence their voice in their efforts to honor him, especially as it relates to the subject of his coming. Because if you do this, the earth will open its mouth to speak on their behalf and will potentially swallow you. The persecution of the church of Jesus, particularly his bride, who rejoice at his coming, is one of the reasons for earthquakes. And because the persecutions of the bride of Christ and his church will increase in the end time, is why there will be many earthquakes in the earth. Selah, meaning pause and think on this. To understand earthquakes more exhaustively, we have to understand our planet. I have helped to provide a scientific overview of the tectonic plates of rocks that causes earthquakes, but it's a larger spiritual perspective we must consider, which I delved into in my message titled, How to Save the Planet, the Geocentric Gospel of the Kingdom of God and Heaven. I would suggest that you watch this message to get a more exhaustive gleaning into the planet we call home. Now returning to my final thought on the science in the earth, and the conclusion of this segment, we have seen from the beginning how that an earthquake marked both the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But did you also know that the deadliest and most destructive earthquake that the world have yet to see will transpire at the return of the Lord Jesus to planet earth? Let's take a quick look at Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4 to 5, which state, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Now, the verse before this tells us why the Mount of Olives will be split into a valley by an earthquake. It says that the Lord will descend on the Mount of Olives to fight against the army of nations that surrounded his people with the intention to harm them. So when we compare this verse of scripture, we look chapter 19 verse 14, when the Lord answered the Pharisees who rebuked his followers and tried to silence them near the foot of the same Mount of Olives, where the Lord said the stones will cry out if his people are silenced we can see that the Lord was referring to an earthquake, censoring, persecuting, and even attempt to silence the voice of God's children in diverse places will lead to hazardous earthquakes in certain locations. Revelation 16 provides a more elaborate depth of understanding. And this is how we shall conclude on this segment of Science in the Earth. I will read. Revelation 16, verse 15 and verses 17 to 19 reads, Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. The seventh angel poured out his bow into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. 
no earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great, and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath.